The China and Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on Africa China relations through innovative training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.co.za. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Network from SubChina. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, the senior China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good evening to you, Kobus. Good evening. Kobus, this is a very special podcast. First, we're coming to you today from the studios at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., where I've been in town to take part in the Georgetown Africa Business Conference that's been absolutely amazing. What a great group of people. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, but also, we'd like to extend a very warm welcome to our new listeners on the Seneca Network and the Seneca Podcast. As some of you may know, our podcast is now part of the Seneca Network with SubChina, and we're just absolutely thrilled to be able to introduce our show to Kaiser and Jeremy's audience. Uh, so for those of you new to our show, a very big welcome and we hope that you'll subscribe and join us every week. Given the fact that I am in Washington, uh, I thought it would be appropriate that we would look at U.S.-China-Africa relations, in particularly because there is so much going on right now. The U.S.-China relationship is undergoing a lot of change, and so is the U.S.-Africa relationship. Cobus, it really feels right now that we are at some kind of inflection point in the relationship between the U.S. and Africa, and the U.S. is really struggling to figure out what it actually wants to be in Africa and what it wants to do. We see this particularly at this point um, with the travel ban having just been expanded to include Tanzania and particularly also Nigeria. So this really changes the relationship between the U.S. and Africa, um, and it really changes the calculus, you know, faced by both China and the U.S. in Africa. Um, you know, the the relationship with with Nigeria on its face seemed to really work. You know, kind of it's a very strong diaspora relationship. They they were partners in anti-terrorism. Um, there's a lot of of, of American um, interest in business um, in Nigeria. So on the face of it, this is a really baffling move. Um, and I think one that, that is really going to shift the relationship. Let's put some dots on the chart just before we start our discussion with our guest today. Uh, and I'm going to look at some of the pros and cons. And what's interesting about being here in Washington and talking about U.S.-Africa relations is not a single conversation goes by where the word China is not included in a conversation about Africa. And it really does feel that the U.S. is focusing on Africa now because of China. So just most recently, the International Finance uh, Corporation CEO, Adam Bowler, uh, he was out in Asia. And on his tour of Asia, again, he's referencing that the way that the U.S. is doing development finance is in contrast to the Chinese. Uh, we hear it from Assistant Secretary of State Tibor Naj, uh, from Ambassador Kyle McCarter in Kenya. All of them are constantly referencing uh, China. So we thought today it would be great to be able to get uh, two experts to join us. And they're coming back to us on the show. First time we've actually had them live in person. So we're very excited to have uh, Jude Moore, who's a visiting fellow at the Center for Global Development and the former Minister of Public Works in Liberia, an expert on African affairs, U.S. African affairs, and also very well versed in China as well. Jude, welcome back to the show. Hi, Eric. Uh, it's great to be back here again. And Kobus, uh, great to be here talking to you and Eric again. And also we're joined, we're thrilled to have back Aubrey Ruby. Many of our longtime listeners of the show will know that she's been with us many, many times. She's a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's Africa Center, also an author, an investor, uh, media communications expert, all things Africa U.S. That is Aubrey. We are thrilled to have you back on the show, Aubrey. Thank you, Eric and Kobus. It's always a pleasure. Jude, let's start with you right now and kind of get your temperature of where we are right now with the U.S.-Africa relationship and where China fits into it. Uh, before we get into the details of the travel ban and some of the trade policies, the fact is, is that U.S. trade with Africa has decreased every year since 2011. We're down to about 40 some odd billion dollars per year. Compare that to the Chinese who are doing $208 billion last year. So about a five times difference. Is this one of the reasons why we're seeing so much focus in Washington on China or is it something that's bigger? Well, again, again, it's great to be back. Yeah, I think part of it will go back to, I, th I think it was in 
January of 2018 that uh, an unclassified version of the U.S. national defense strategy for the first time designated China as a, a competitor. Um, and so the U.S. sees China as a competitor. And because of that, looking at China through that prism means it's a zero-sum game. So wherever there's an increase or an advantage for China is interpreted as a loss for the United States. And China's growth on the continent is seen that way. And so, for example, General Stephen Townsend, he's now the new head of AFRICOM, in his um, um, Senate confirmation, you know, spoke about the future of Africa being determined largely um, by the impact of external actors and that China had chosen to compete and compete hard on the continent. And consequently, the U.S. had to respond. So what we're seeing is sort of uh, an argument within the American government itself. The professional class of the American government and maybe a part of Congress sees Africa as the future, just the way the, U the Europeans see it, the way the Chinese see it, and believe that stronger relationships with Africa, growth in, in trade and exchange with Africa is great. But I think the administration doesn't necessarily share that. And so you have this schizophrenic policy when it comes to what Africa. In the one hand, last year, they unveiled uh, Prosper Africa, which intends to double two-way trade between the continent and, 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 and the U.S. And somehow you're going to do that without Nigeria, which, depending on the day of the, the, the week you're counting, is the largest economy or the second largest economy uh, um, on the continent. Second thing also is that Nigerians in the U.S. are the largest diaspora group, probably making, in terms of African diaspora in the United States, making probably the biggest contribution as, an, as a group here in the United States. So it's sort of difficult to be able to understand. And when Ambassador Bol Bolton first talked about Prosper Africa, about a change in American approach to engagement with the continent, he spent more time talking about China than he did about Africa. So it seems, from us looking at it, that American engagement in Africa, especially on the part of this administration, has mostly been shaped by trying to respond to what China is doing there and not so much an interest in Africans um, themselves or in what the continent offers. The professional side, though, Korea State Department, Korea Commerce Department, uh, um, Congress, sees the long term that the very identity of humanity, the future identity of humanity, is largely African. And consequently, there's a need to have that strong relationship with the continent. So there is like a, 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 an argument happening within the U.S. I mean, just look, yesterday, the um, travel ban is announced. And then um, Assistant Secretary comes on Twitter to announce, oh, I'm so happy the Nigerians are coming so that we can be able to discuss. Within an hour. I mean, within an hour. And that really showed the lack of coordination, coordination. between the, within the government. Aubrey, let's get your take on, on the big picture of where we are. And you know, again, taking into account where China fits into all of this. Yeah. So the, over the last four years, basically since Trump uh, took over in the U.S., there's been a strong view that our global policy footing has to be one of competition with China. And that desire for, I don't know, a Cold War simplistic type structure where it's us versus them, I think is really set in. It's an, it's kind of an ossified mindset that has has taken hold in, in all areas of uh, U.S. government policymaking. It's not just in the Africa space. And we've seen that uh, in regards to the, the trade war and discussions around the future of 5G technology and how we engage with the Brits, for example, on them using Huawei. So the China thread uh, is tied all the way through policymaking and Africa is no different. As Jude said, it has actually elevated Africa in a strategic sense to some extent because China has been historically so active in African markets relative to other players and therefore the U.S. has to pay attention. Um, and so you you see that and it shapes it, this view that we have to be competitive. But I do want to emphasize that it's not a Republican or Trump view only, that the concern around U.S. competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis China is one that's shared bipartisanly. It's across party lines. I have talked to many members of Congress who are Democrats and otherwise who are not uh, of the view that they are uh, pro-China in any way. Um, so it, in some ways, the uh, concern around the Uyghurs and what's been done uh, to the treatment of the Muslim minority uh, and other human rights issues brings another group of people into the uh, anti-China camp within the Washington community.
Aubrey, just um, following up on that, um, can you give us an idea of what has happened with the, the Prosper Africa initiative since it's been announced? You know, kind of we saw a big announcement and then after that, I haven't seen that much action on it. Like, wh- where is it actually standing now? So the Prosper Africa initiative, as Jude said, has this bold vision of doubling two-way trade and investment. Um, We've all been waiting for some kind of implementation plan to come out on how that's going to be achieved. Um, Certainly what's been achieved during this administration is we've kind of sharpened the tools that we have for commercial diplomacy. So Eric just referenced the uh, new Development Finance Corporation. The BUILD Act doubled the size of the former OPIC. So DFC is now a supercharged OPIC and it has more uh, power as well, not just more money. And, and then XM Bank, U.S. XM Bank, which was basically hobbled for um, almost a decade, is now back in business and doing Africa deals. So we have more tools to use. Prosper Africa's vision was to create mechanisms that would A, better coordinate those tools, and B, let the world know about or American companies know about these tools and to kind of push and mobilize more more investor interest. Um, I think most of us would say that we're still waiting on how that is going to actually be operational. Uh, Prosper Africa is having an event this coming week in Tunis, where they're going to talk again about what they're going to do. And many of us, like Judy and myself, are waiting to see what, if anything new, is announced. Uh, To me, the biggest challenge that Prosper Africa has is it doesn't really have priorities. So it's not very clear to uh, the business community what sectors, for example, Prosper Africa is promoting. Uh, It would be good to have a focus, at least with Power Africa, which was the Obama administration's uh, policy Uh, initiative for Africa. We knew it was about electricity and power, and therefore power companies and and investors in power could be mobilized around that. Prosper Africa, I mean, it's about prosperity, which is, you know, hard to organize and have a meeting around in the same way you can have a meeting about electricity constraints in key markets. So we'd like to see more priorities announced uh, for Prosper Africa in order to make it more effective. Jude, Just following up on some of the initiatives that Aubrey was talking about, Power Africa, Prosper Africa, and for a lot of people who are listening uh, from the China side of the equation, these are all new concepts. And one of the things about the Exim Bank and even about uh, the International Development Development Finance Corporation is it wasn't that long ago that both of these were on the chopping block. They were on death's door. Mm -hmm. And then what really brought them off the block was China. And the motivation in Congress to, to fund these and to get them over the line was to say, we want to take on the Chinese in places like Africa. Mm-hmm. IDFC, by the way, has a global mandate. It was funded at $60 billion. It's my understanding that about a third of that is allocated to Africa with no time frame, unlike, say, FOCAC, which has a three-year time frame. So really, they're coming to a gunfight with knives that right there in terms of resources. But let's just get to the fact of the rhetoric, because there was an interesting interview that Dixon Olewe, who is the BBC Africa correspondent, did with Ambassador Wu Peng in Nairobi. And Wu Peng said, Africans want action. This is a continent of young people. This is a continent that's fam- facing a demographic time bomb right now. And then we saw in Ghana that the Sino-Hydro bauxite deal that the Chinese did with the Ghanaian government, went from signing to shovels in the ground in 18 months. Here, Aubrey's telling us that we're going yet again, 10 months later after Prosper Africa, to do more talks. We haven't seen anything. One of the advantages that I see that Chinese have in Africa is people can see what they do. Mm. I see the road. I see the products. I see the cell phone network. I see Huawei. I see techno. I see Boomplay. We don't see what the Americans do. Talk to us a little bit about the expectations that Africans may have now, and are they in fact running out of patience with Americans and all their promises? So a couple of things. I think uh, the United States um, continues to have inbuilt advantages on the continent in terms of the attractiveness of its soft power, in terms of um, um, especially in, in, in popular culture. Uh, the, the United States continues to dominate that. And, and for many Africans, the United States still remains an attractive option in terms of where they want to go and how they want to see themselves. What's happened with China's presence on the continent, though, hasn't simply affected the United States in terms of how it responds to the continent. Because we saw the UK now saying after Brexit, they want the UK to become Africa's choice as a trade partner. So um, Turkey uh, has 
in the last 12 years has gone from 12 to 42 embassies. The Turkish prime minister is currently on the continent trying to build those kinds of relationships, right? The Russians are making a significant play with a limited checkbook, but yeah, they're making a significant play on the continent. So I think that um, it's a good thing that for the first time in a long time, we're having a conversation about Africa, and it's not because there's Ebola or because of war, it's because Africa is being seen as an opportunity. Africa is being seen as a place to do business and commerce, and that's a good thing. And Aubrey talked about this a bit. It seems as if the United States sees all of this infrastructure that China is doing and for some reason insists on competing with China in infrastructure. That hasn't been an American advantage over the last 40, 50 years. And it seems as if this inability to focus on a sector and double down on American strengths, but to try to compete with China across the board on almost everything, it creates this mismatch. You're not bringing as much resources to the table as the Chinese are, and you probably are not going to do that because the U.S. government is not set up to operate like that. You don't have American-owned government-backed firms that receive instructions from the U.S. government in terms of where to invest, how to invest, and what to do. Second thing is speed. There is, it's really, really difficult. I, I always give this example of being the Minister of Infrastructure in a very tropical country with six months out of the year, um, you can do uh, civil works. And the, the time it takes, 24 months, 36 months from concept to first disbursement, it takes, by the time I'm doing the project, my term is coming to an end. I'm an, a, a politician who needs to be reelected, who needs to demonstrate to people that I'm delivering. And China has an advantage here with speed, with resources, with fewer uh, uh, um, red tape. And so I think there are things in, a, in which the U.S., especially when it comes to the creative sector, when it comes to education, there are significant inbuilt uh, um, advantages for the United States, and I think doubling down on that, selecting a couple of sectors and focusing on those sectors will be significantly great. I will also say, everyone who comes into Africa comes into Africa with a certain set, a certain set of values, and structuring businesses, ensuring a business, govern, corporate governance is something that U.S. investment is going to bring. So I think both the United States and China have unique competences, both of which are required on the continent, but this insistence on competing in a space where you may not have an advantage. It's why it looks so, the, the imbalance is so stark to the Africans. You say you're going to come to Africa to do infrastructure and you're coming with, you know, 60 billion for the entire DFC when China says over the next three years, I'm going to spend 60 billion in Africa. I think this one-on-one -on -one competition is not working in favor of the United States. Um, G. Dave, following on your on your point about soft power, I mean, you know, I've, I I I hear that formulation a lot. You know that that, and and I agree with you that that the the, the popularity of U.S. media in Africa is is very high. Um, that in lots of ways, particularly African American media, has a particular place in the heart of Africa, um, and that that then translates into into soft power for the U.S. However, uh, a do you think that that how do you think the the travel ban is going to affect that? You know, because the travel ban does I think it's easy to read it as simply as a, as a gesture of hostility, you know, to 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 Africa's largest economy. But then also, like you know, the the U.S. is pop culture, particularly African-American pop culture, is in lots of ways quite critical about the U.S. Um, you know, so I'm thinking of someone like Beyonce, for example, you know, kind of who, who has done, uh, who has done, you know, quite pointed work about racism, about police brutality and so on. And, and, and you know, just as an experience of, of, of teaching young Africans um, in a media studies class, they are highly aware of that. They're very aware of Black Lives Matter. They're very aware of, of these problems inherent to the U.S., particularly in relation to race. So how, so I wonder if you could unpack that a little bit about you, but this is kind of idea of, of U.S. soft power always being strong in Africa because of its media, is, uh, of its media strength. Is that necessarily a stable thing or do you think it could change or shift over time? I, I think I'm really hopeful about that. So, for example, um, in the Super Bowl, there are uh, 
Nigerian American, and there's even a Liberian American playing running back for the um, San, for San Francisco 49ers. So there is a rising prominence of Africans, even in American pop culture, right? We see Beyonce doing collabos with Remy, doing collabos with Black Coffee from South Africa. We see Drake featuring Davido. So there is that interaction between African pop culture and American pop culture, and I think that's going to continue to be there. And, and I think that attractiveness, I, and, and this is where I think in Ch- there's a limit to China's uh, soft power because the U.S. system is capable of absorbing that critique, that criticism of, 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 a, of a system of racism and, and, and allows that. And I think China still struggles with how to accommodate criticism. And the more powerful China becomes, the more point that that criticism is going to become and how China engages that is going to be, I think it's going to be slightly difficult. I just wanted to repeat some numbers to come back to the Nigeria thing from a Vox article that currently Nigerians make up the largest population of African immigrants here. They are about 327,000. That Nigerians last year got 14,000 green cards and all of the other countries that were included got 6,000 green cards. That's how massive in terms of the Nigerian presence here in the in, in it. And now most of the pop culture things we're seeing in terms of the crossover, we saw Burner Boy on uh, on uh, the Trevor Noah show or even Trevor Noah doing the Daily Show. I think that attractiveness is going to continue to be there. And the final thing I would say to that is that there is a plethora of streaming services now. NBC is doing one, Disney's doing one, Netflix, HBO, everybody's doing one. And we're beginning to see, especially on Netflix, African content, right? And so African creative content create, um, uh, providers are going to have in the West, especially here in the U.S., these multiple platforms that they can use for market. So I think there's a growth opportunity there, and that is why I think that's an, an advantage, advantage that the U.S. can press. Aubrey, let's pick up on that a little bit in this schizophrenia in U.S. policy that jude has been talking about, where on the one hand, we hear this really China-fueled message about rivaling China and Africa, which is increasingly evident that we can't do. You meet with a lot of U.S. policymakers, and they will tell you in private how pissed off they are. And we see tantrums from time to time of we don't get the credit for all the great things that we do. China's getting all the headlines. China's getting all the attention. Why don't people appreciate what we've done for PEPFAR and saving millions of lives through our aid programs, through our health programs, the fact that we have all these these cultural initiatives? Where is the disconnect that's happening in U.S. policy? and, and, And why does China factor so much in that disconnect? Well, the U.S. has historically been the largest donor, uh, single donor country to the African continent. And investor, too, right? Yes, uh, depending on it, how you count the investment. Um, if you take out China's uh, loans, their their financing of infrastructure, then for sure uh, the U.S. is one of the largest investors. And so what we see, though, is that there is a kind of um, inability to... Uh, reconcile a a switch in philosophy about that aid. So historically, the donor was the don the donor action, the, the, the giving of aid was seen as like a form of kind of charity, humanitarian effort, a kind of enlightened self-interest that stemmed from the Marshall Plan, et cetera. And at different points in our history, we've given aid for different reasons. There was the Cold War where it was for political allegiance. And the philosophy of why we give support and what drives USAID is changing under this administration. There's been something called the Foreign Assistance Review, and it's been underway for years, uh, two years now. Uh, Trump first referred to it, I think, in the middle of 2018. And that process is undergoing, and they're looking at every way and we do, how we give aid, where we're giving it, what are the programs, et cetera. And so in that, um, the question is switching away, not just from giving charity or humanitarian aspects, but more of a transactional. What do we get back for it? And this view that everything needs to be reciprocal. We give things, we should get something back. And that is an ideology that is not just Africa specific, right? The, this administration has been always for bilateral trade agreements, for example, where they can have a, a negotiation or a bargaining of things that you give and get in return. They've been pushing, for example, for NATO members to pay more 
for NATO security services and saying, what do we get for all the money that we've been giving to security in Europe all these years? It's time for Europeans to start paying. So this idea that like there needs to be reciprocal relationships and transactional, what do we get for this, is not just an, a, an Africa policy phenomenon. That's a global philosophical stance that this administration has taken and one that resonates probably with many Americans, right? You're, what are you buying for your investment in taxpayer money that goes abroad? Uh, and so that is is impacting the Africa space as well, saying, OK, the U.S. has been the donor of last resort. We paid for a lot of the doctors for the Ebola fight. Um, we continue to pay for uh, many, many people who to be on antiretrovirals in the fight for USAID. And so this kind of donor of last resort uh, role that is accompanied by the being the kind of policeman of the world view uh, is being threatened because there the view is that we should get something for this and it's no longer a day of of taking that american charity or last resort uh for granted i think uh, on that question is and and this is in, you you see the contrast really stark with china like uh, the guy from um, power africa said during the conference there are tens of millions of Africans in Central and Southern Africa, across the continent, but mainly in Central and Southern Africa, who are alive today because of American aid. Billions of dollars, right, that goes into an, in ARVs. The thing about U.S. giving to the continent, especially U.S. aid, is significantly focused in the soft areas. Is about social welfare, um, women's programs, um, girls' programs, um, health programs, and... and, and um, agricultural programs, whereas China builds hard stuff. The, the Chinese public diplomacy is stadiums, is building physical stuff that people can see. So if you're walking in Zimbabwe and Malawi today, there are lots of people you're passing in the street, streets who are alive because of U.S. aid. But when you look down the road, you can see the new stadium that the Chinese built. And so there's something more visible about the, the way China does it and the way the U.S. does it. So I think it's an issue of communication to, to be able to, how does the U.S. draw attention to the impact, a huge impact? Because without the health care that is provided by American aid, it's almost impossible to talk about business. But for some reason, the Chinese aid tends to be, because it's focused on hard, tangible uh, um, assets, is more visible than, say, the U.S. one. And let's not forget Ebola that the United States was single-handedly responsible for helping to stop the Ebola crisis Absolutely. in West Africa. I mean, amazing contribution that they did. Go ahead, Kobus. Well, you know, just if, you know, if one is com comparing health impacts, then, then, you know, China has also saved, you know, thousands of lives through malaria work in Africa, you know, and, and through through decades, decades and decades of, of volunteer medical teams being sent over since the 60s. So, you know, so in that sense, you know, it's, they, they, they kind of they, they play they, 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 they should be playing a more complementary role you know kind of to, in Africa than, than I think they are um, on, on a different issue um, Obi, I wanted to to, um, to ask you about the, how, how you see the discourse about debt uh, particularly Chinese debt in Africa changing um, you know kind of we've seen that the, the, the Trump administration pushing the narrative that, of, of the debt trap that that China is essentially on purpose indebting African countries or like poor countries around the world in order to then gain uh, leverage over them. Um, at the same time, we've seen a, a lot more hesitance about African debt coming out of Beijing. You know, kind of the, um, the at the Belt and Road um, uh, conference last year, um, the announcement that, you know, that they're going to be a lot more hard-nosed about which projects they fund, a, a real hesitance to to fund even, even um, you know, kind of headliner projects like the, the Standard Gauge Railway which which in the past was seen as this, as this like amazing Chinese initiative for for, for trans frontier integration the Chinese stepped away from later phases of that um, you know if, if you if you just look at the Beijing side there seems to be a lot more hesitance about about African debt if you listen to the narrative out of Washington you don't really hear that you you, you know kind of the China presented there is one that that is very hungry for debt then for geopolitical reasons how, how do you see what is your take on, on Chinese debt in Africa and also the way that the U.S. sees it? Well, I'll start with the, the last part of your question. The way that the U.S. sees it is very simplistically that um, that debt levels are rising in African 
countries that we know empirically to be true, uh, and that many of these countries are the same ones that just graduated the HIPIC program, which was highly indebted poor countries uh, program at the World Bank, and they were basically given debt relief from uh, you know borrowing twenty plus years ago. And so the view is that, oh, here we go again with a debt problem in African countries. Uh, and that's a very simplistic narrative. And then the second part of it from the U.S. perspective is that that debt is coming from China. Um, and so that's the simplistic story that's being told. And it's at the root of a lot of messaging that you see from American officials about why we need to give the U.S. Uh, the U.S. model a try in Africa and why we uh, have a different approach and that we're, when we come, we don't create indebtedness, which is true. That part is true. The way that the U.S. structures our, um, our grants through MCC, Millennium Challenge Corporation, through USAID, those go through third-party NGO-type players. Um, MCC money gives through uh, procurement to companies. And then uh, the the money that goes through the DFC or XM goes through companies, through projects. So we don't have a mechanism for government to government loans. So we do not incur we do not increase debt levels by our commercial footprint in African markets. That's a, a truth. Now the overall picture is more complex. We know that African countries are uh, having rising debt levels, not just because of Chinese loans, but because of Eurobond uh, borrowing. And Eurobond usage has increased dramatically over the past uh, 10 years as more and more African governments can tap international markets for financing. And then the other thing we know is that there's good debt and bad debt. If the debt that you take on as a country is um, is used to build infrastructure, to create economic growth, then you need to take on that debt. Um, if it's used for projects that are not growth uh, creating or produ productivity enhancing, then that might be bad debt. But overall, the IMF is seeing average of um, your kind of GDP to debt ratio uh, coming down to around 60 percent. And they're usually looking at 55 percent as the average um, that they want to see for a healthy range in, in African markets. And again, this is very regional specific because, yes, people can say Japan has one that's like 200 percent or the U.S. obviously has enormous debt. But you're always looking at countries' ability to pay on that debt. And so you're looking at things like your tax base and the GDP to tax ratio, um, which in all African countries is very low. Even South Africa, which collects the most taxes, still has basically 5 million taxpayers for the full population. And so we, because the countries don't have a robust tax base, they don't necessarily have the ability to pay down larger, larger chunks of debt. So that's why people who say that Africa has a different standard, it is true because of the economic construct, construct um, of the economies in the, um, in the region. Okay, Judy, last question for our discussion is going to come to you. Looking forward, um, we started our discussion today talking about how much of U.S. policy in Africa is motivated by a desire to confront and challenge China. If you look at that on its merits, um, I would say that it's been an abject failure. Let's look at the fact that the United States has tried to persuade African countries to not use Huawei equipment. Not a single African country has listened. The United States has tried to persuade African countries to take their side uh, on, against China on Xinjiang. Not only has a Afri not any African country sided with the Americans, uh, 17 African countries actually signed a letter. And Wang Yi, the Chinese foreign minister, showed up in January in Cairo at the heart of the Arab street and brought the Xinjiang message and was warmly embraced by it. Um, at the Food and Agriculture Organization, the entire African delegation supported the Chinese candidate. Uh, in fact, the Cameroonian uh, candidate withdrew in order to make room and space for the Chinese candidate. I can go on uh, quite a bit about this. It does not look like U.S. policy is be that effective going forward. It looks like the Chinese are getting momentum in terms of building political relationships that are now turning into real dividends in terms of global power. Uh, how do you see it looking forward for the next two to four years? On that question here, I think, Eric, you can say that, that American attempts uh, at uh, challenging China has been an abject failure. As, as a non-American myself, as an, as an African who's looking to see the U.S. increase, I hope that's not the case. Africa doesn't want a single partner to dominate its relationships. I think there's a healthy tension if we have two 
three, four big partners, and each of them deploying a unique competence. And my hope is that uh, U.S. policy um, toward the continent is more structured, is long term, is strategic, and it's, it begins to take advantage of American um, um, strengths. I think on the Chinese side, we it's been 20 years since the first going out, and and we will look to see the uh, differences in the quality of Chinese engagement on the continent. One of the things I always like to talk about is how, uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a foreign student going to school in the U.S., when I'm done with my studies, there are legal ways for me to remain in the U.S. and work here as an African. And that has been a challenge for African students studying in China, even though the number of African students studying in China has gone up. Supposedly, there are over a million mi- Chinese migrants on the continent. And uh, in one of Howard French's books, he says that uh, African governments have been pressed a bit to be a little flexible in terms of allowing Chinese migrants and Chinese businesses. That The uh, um, opposite of that hasn't happened in terms of Africans having a legal channel of being able to set up business in China, stay in China after the, 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 they're educated and stuff like that. Second thing is this massive two-way trade between the continent and and. and and China is beginning to look like the patterns of old trade that we've seen before, where we're sending out unfinished material, raw materials, and important capital equipment from China, finished goods from China. And that trade imbalance ultimately is unhealthy. And so in terms of um, the relationship between China and the continent, the hope is that in this uh, third decade since going out, we will begin to see differences in that. And I think the Chinese are beginning to do that. We, we saw them open the market to Kenyan avocados. But not only that, decrease the, the tariffs from 30% to 7%. We saw them um, open the market to um, Namibian beef. I mean, the problem is there's a drought in Namibia now, making it difficult for them to take advantage of that. I think if we begin to see more and more of that, and as the cost of production begins to go up in China, hopefully some of that um, industrial capacity is taken up by Africa and we can be able to send finished goods to, to, to China. But going forward... As an African looking for engagement from the rest of the world, my hope is that the UK will come in with significant amount of capital to invest, that Turkey will bring capital, that India will bring capital, that uh, Japan will bring capital, Korea will bring capital, the United States will be there, and each of them deploying their unique competence and strength, working with African governments for us to be able to deliver the future that Africa deserves. That is an excellent place to end. But before we go... You did mention the New Think podcast. I want to make sure that we have uh, both our audience and also the Seneca podcast audience gets a chance to understand a little bit about what you guys are doing. You're bringing in this idea of big ideas. That's what you want to address uh, for Africa. And it's not just Africa, though, right? Is it just about the global south developing world? Tell us a little bit more about the New Think podcast. Sure. On the New Think podcast, what we're what Jude and I are really aiming at is trying to discover new and big ideas that can be applied to the enormous development challenges that the world faces. Um, because we know that African countries in particular have to create uh, millions of jobs, and we're talking tens of millions of jobs annually, in order to absorb the youth population uh, that is entering the labor force. And that's not even counting the unemployed today or the underemployed. And where that scale of challenge is unfaced in human history. China didn't have to create that many jobs annually. India didn't have to create that many jobs annually because of the number of people involved, because Africa is already over a billion people, and you have very high uh, population growth rates relatively. And so really, we believe that right now there's no incremental ideas that you can apply that are going to really create all of those jobs. And maybe some of the windows that have been used by countries like China uh, or Vietnam or um, or India have been closed, some things like light manufacturing, et cetera, as technology changes. So we're looking all over the world for ideas, whether they be, um, you know, in African markets or, you know, folks who never have ever been to the continent to try to discover what could be applied to radically change the trajectory of, of development in some countries. So it's fun. It's called New Think. Uh, Jude and I are the co-hosts, and we like to bring guests from all over. So join us in that uh, vision. And we'll include a link to the, the, the New Think podcast so you can subscribe. Uh, Aubrey, if people want to follow what you're reading and writing and want to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to connect? Twitter is the best uh, for me. Uh, so my handle is at Aubrey Ruby, but my last name is spelled H-R-U-B-Y. And Jude, tell them where they can find you. 
I'm on Twitter too. It's uh, at Jude Moore and Jude is G-Y-U-D-E. And Jude is a visiting fellow at the Center for Global Development and the former Infrastructure Public Works Minister of Liberia. Aubrey Ruby is a senior fellow at the Atlantic Center. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank Thanks you. for having us. And for everybody who wants to follow China Africa news in depth, we have our brand new daily newsletter and a subscription, which you can find on the China Africa Project website. So if this is a topic that you find interesting, this is what we cover uh, day in, day out. Uh, Aubrey gets it every day. So hopefully, Jude, you're going to sign up for it one of these days. So I'm, I'm, that's my goal by the end of the year. I got to get you to sign up. I, I, I get the free one. I'm going to sign I'm going to sign up for the paid one. We do, have, we do have a free one on Fridays, but we'd like to encourage everybody to check that out. Uh, for Cobus Van Staden, I'm Eric Olander today coming to you from the Georgetown Studios in Washington, D.C. Also, a very, very big thank you to the Georgetown community and Daniel Wajira, who's an MBA student from Kenya here at Georgetown, who's been such an incredibly gracious host. So we'll be back again next week with another edition of the China in Africa podcast. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. The guys are also on Twitter where you can find Gwobas at Studinsky or Eric at E. Olander. And be sure to sign up for the weekly China and Africa email newsletter by going to www.chinaafricaproject.com.